You're listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where usually each week I interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I'm saying usually, because this is another one of my bonus episodes where we're going to do a whole bunch of book recommendations. I don't have an author on, but I have someone even better than an author. It is my buddy Tina from the very, very popular TBR, etc. Instagram and extremely fantastic Book Talk, etc. podcast. Tina and I have known each other online forever and ever and ever, and now we get to be book podcast buddies. First off, Tina, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. It's fun to be a guest on a podcast. It's it's a different cadence for sure. It's like a whole different Mm -hmm. process and it's everything is new. So before we get into what we're going to do, which is going to be book recommendations back and forth for a little while, we're just going to give you six book recommendations, and I want to qualify for everyone. We are doing backlist book recommendations because Tina's podcast is one where they, and quite literally their most recent episode talks about this, they get distracted by new releases and they talk about new releases a lot. So in an effort to make sure that (laughs) Tina didn't have to do something that was like repetitive and cut out her own podcasting, I asked her to do backlist stuff. So that is what we're going to do. But before that, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about your podcast in case they're unfamiliar? Uh, And then, yeah, we'll, we'll dive into some fun stuff. Hi there. I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So I am the co-host of the Book Talk, Etc. podcast. I co-host with Renee at It's Book Talk. And she and I both met on Bookstagram. That was kind of our origin story. And I've been talking books online for about seven years now, which is such a long time when you think when you think about it. Um, but it's been so fun. And I was really looking toward my backlist, trying to find ones that I haven't talked about recently. And I'm like, wow, wow, there is a lot of books that I've shared about online. Um, But our podcast is every week. It's a book recommendation podcast. And we call it a conversational podcast because it's just Renee and I talking about what we've read recently and we'll have a topic. And, you know, we have a very... I love our listeners. We have a very engaged listenership and our, you know, Patreon is very important to us too. So it's been a really fun endeavor. We've been doing it for about coming up on a year and a half now. So we're actually at about 89 episodes and I'm like, oh man, we got to think of something fun for our hundredth episode. But yeah, that's book talk, et cetera. And and I'm not just saying this because Tina is my friend, but it quickly became my favorite podcast to listen to for book recommendations. As people who know, I used, you know, I used to be in the literary world where I would get to kind of like what Tina does now, like I would get and I a little bit now I get sent books ahead of time. But like I used to get basically like a full rundown of like from every publisher, every publicist, like here's the books coming out for like the next six months. And so I got to be the person who is like in the know, like here's what you have to read. And I both don't get to or have to do that anymore, depending on how you want to look at it. So I literally, (laughs) I listen every single week to Tina and Renee, and I cannot tell you the amount of books I have added to my TBR list because of you two. So I... Yeah. What a compliment. And I know y'all are fans of Adam. So he was our guest on episode 28. So be sure to tune into that. He was our very first guest ever. We don't do a lot of guests, but when we do, they're High quality. (laughs) Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That no, I had a a blast. I think that I I remember at least at the time it was one of your longer episodes because as people who know me, I'm a very chatty person. (laughs) Well, same with me and Renee. We just get excited. I'm like, oh, we'll keep it to an hour. And it's like cut to like an hour 15. Whoops. But you know, all, all good fun. 
Yeah. So uh, we're going to dive into some book recommendations in just a minute. But first, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about whatever book we are currently reading or have recently read. Um, mine is to give Tina a little bit of a intro, uh, like a, a, a lead in to get to talk about some more stuff about her podcast. So I'm just I'll go first really quickly. I just finished a book called Meme and I talked about it on my Instagram. So I'm not going to talk too much about the plot here also because I don't want to undercut your guys's book discussion. But <laughs> basically, it is the story of a 25 year old Gahanian woman who is living in England with her father who is very, very sick. She's taking care of him because her mother is in Ghana. Her mother comes back. This is like the shortest version of this possible. Her mother comes back, is living with her father. So at 25, she finally decides to move out and sort of start living her life really for the first time. She, you know, goes on dates for the first time and she decides to uh, smoke for the first time and go out and she drinks and mm -hmm. like she d meets these new roommates. And uh, a tragic thing happens that sort of like, throws her life into asunder and she has to deal with all of these very very adult things as a person who's still learning how to be an adult like one of my favorite things about the book is she's constantly googling questions like very simple <gasps> things like yeah how do you prefer yeah. for a first date um but then uh it, she just it, there's a lot of like subtle things that aren't the main aspects of the plot but like she works in publishing and she deals with racism which is something that's very very prevalent unfortunately in publishing still and all these like microaggressions and different things and it's a really really wonderful book um the ending just like I finished it last week and I've yeah. still been thinking about it. it. Definitely made me cry. Uh, so I've been reading Mame and the reason I will let you explain why I wanted to talk about that one first and then you can get into your current read. Of course. So yes, that's our, uh, our community read for February. I had to stop and think, I'm like, what month are we in? <laughs> but that is our community read. So a part of our Patreon benefit is every month uh, Renee and I, one of us chooses a book that we're all going to read together. And then at the end of the month, we go live on our Discord and discuss it. So it's kind of like book club, but it's um, fun because we chat throughout the month like about our thoughts. And, you know, that book is so special because it takes you on a lot of different twists and turns. You described it so well and you pulled out some of the things that I really loved about it, like the Googling. And I'm thinking, how brilliant, because I do the same thing. I always joke, I'm an only child. So like, I don't know a lot. And I'm always like Googling things to figure out like what's normal. And the character is so charming. And I just love the ending. You're right. The ending made me cry. And I was like, I loved it from the beginning, but then I like it was five star territory by the end. So I, mm -hmm. I love when books get that kind of arc. And she's getting a lot of praise too. This is her debut. It's a read with Jenna Pick. It was picked up for book of the month. So I'm really happy people are getting their eyes on it. Yeah, that was a, I will say really quick, that was a bad job podcasting by me. It's by Jessica George, mm -hmm. who's the author and for everyone oh. listening. <laughs> yeah, I just realized I was like, I didn't say the author's name. And I will say for everyone listening and every book we recommend today will be in the show notes. So don't worry about fiercely writing yeah. them down. So anyway, now, what are you reading, yes. Tina? Now we'll go into mine. Oh my goodness. And I will say, I... Okay, mine is The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. This is another debut. This book could not be more in my wheelhouse. It is a psychological thriller. And it's kind of about writers behaving badly, which I love. And it's a bit of a locked room mystery. So this is about Alex, who basically has had the worst case of writer's block for about a year. And then she receives a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to attend an exclusive month-long writing retreat at the estate of feminist horror novelist Rosa Vallo. And this person, Rosa, has been her hero. So of course she takes the invitation. But when they get there, there's like five other girls or five other women and she realizes, oh, things are getting dark. This book is very gothic, very feminist. It took a lot of twists and turns to the point where I, I like to take notes where I'm writing, all caps, I'm writing, oh my God. Like once I figured out what was going on, I'm like, no, she did it. So I loved it. I just finished it last night with like one eye open as I was reading in bed. It was so fun. But yeah, if you like psych thrillers, if you like feminist novels, I think there were, no offense, Adam, there was like two males in this story at all. And they were like very much in the periphery. So it was kind of fun to read a book that's very, very female focused. But I thought this one nailed it. If you like thrillers, I do think you'll like this one. Um, and this is another book of the month pick. It's The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. I love how you're like, you say no offense as if I'm going to be like, oh, there aren't men in that book. How dare. <laughs> 
<laughs> how dare literally there was like one like two little mentions of male characters the rest was mm-hmm. very female and oh man i i can't i want to i want to talk about it so somebody needs to read it and, and message me <laughs> about it because it was fun right. well i i can read it and i will i will share my thoughts with you even though there's no I men in it like oh, it I know. <laughs> I, I listen, I will say, because I knew you were the person coming out, one of my recommendations is a thriller because and I have a specific reason why, because you were coming in. Yeah. So um all right. So like Good. I said, the for, the format of this super relaxed scene and I are just gonna go back and forth and do uh six book recommendations each. So I will uh, give you the floor as as the guest. So what is your first right. backlist recommendation for everybody? All right. I will happily start. And I tried to bring one from each of what I consider my favorite genres. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a wide range. So number one for me is How It Went Down by Kekla Magoon. This one came out in 2014 and it's YA. Oh man, I read this, but probably when it was released and I still think about it periodically. It's about 16-year-old Tariq Johnson who dies from two gunshot wounds. And of course, his community is absolutely thrown into an uproar. And Tariq was Black and the shooter, Jack Franklin, is white. And what I think is so brilliant about this book is that it's told from the point of views of the members of the community. So you're hearing about this from all different sides, including the girl who found him, his sister who has special needs, his mom, grandma, friends, the shopkeeper. Everybody has something to say, but you can really see how no two sides actually are the same. And like you're trying to figure out what really went down. There's so many layers in the story. And through their viewpoints, we come to find out who Tariq was. Was he a good student? Was he a gang member? Did he have a gun or was he holding chocolate? At the end of the day, does it matter? Um, Because at the end of the day, you know, he didn't deserve to die. Mm -hmm. Now, I really recommend this book because it's YA and the author introduces really, really important themes, but they're so accessible to younger readers. She chose to use language that I think is very accurate of how young people might speak. Uh And I know some read, you know, some readers are like, oh, I don't know about the language, but I thought it lent authenticity to the story. This is very, very thought provoking and very sensitive, but she does such a good job. And of course, you can't help but read this and not draw parallels to the things we're still seeing today. Mm -hmm. Um, But I loved this book. I recommend it at every chance I get. This was How It Went Down by Kekla Magoon. I have actually not read that. And, and I love that you mentioned about yes. how how they, they wrote in a way that like is relatable to young readers. I actually had this conversation that we're recording this in the, uh, on Wednesday, February 8th. So I had an episode come out this today with uh, Nick Brooks, who wrote this book called Promise Boys, which like is everywhere. Oh my goodness. I can't wait to read that. It, yeah. Yeah. And um, he talked about how like, because I asked him, I was like, he's still relatively young. But I was like, how do you, his book is set in, DC and it's like a kind of a murder mystery where these African Americans get wrongfully accused of murdering their principal. And I was like, so how do you stay relating, like relate to the kids that you're talking to? And he said the same thing that Jason Reynolds just told me, which is a name drop and I'm sorry. Um, Basically, he said, he's like, I, when I go and I present to kids, like I shut up and I listen and I'm like, okay, what are the things you're saying? And like, I, I think yeah. It makes more sense for a young adult book to be written like a young adult would speak and to have them relate to it yes. as opposed to us who are getting further and further away from being young adults. Right. And I think parents might see this book and think, oh, this language is too harsh for my kid. But like, guess what? They're seeing it, right? They have access talk. to the internet. They have TikTok. Like they're going yeah. to hear it. So why not have it presented in this beautiful story that they'll actually be potentially relating to? Hopefully yeah. not, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Right. Really good story. Yeah. Okay, so my first one is Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist by Sunil Yappa. This came out in 2016. And it is, it's a story that is based in Seattle during, um, it was the World Trade Organization riots. They, it, like, it just actually happened. They called it the Battle for Seattle, which, all right, it's fun to say, but, you know, you still don't want to <laughs> have something of this happen. Basically, what happens is the main character's name is Victor. And he is really like depressed after the death of his mother. And he spent three years wandering around and he is trying to kind of reconnect with his family and his home when he comes back to Seattle and 
this World Trade Organization like riot is happening basically. And Victor is young and biracial and he's caught on one side of the barricade and his estranged father is the white chief of police of Seattle. So um, it's basically a day spent with the chaos of everything going on in the streets and him trying to find his way home and figure out a way to reconnect with his father. And it's just like, it's very, very like heart-wrenching and kind of heartbreaking, but it reminds me of... um, uh, I'm not dying with you tonight, which is a, another young adult book. This isn't young adult, but it kind of reminds me of that same vibe where like there's people trying to survive like ba- more or less a race riot. Um, it is fantastic. It I'm a big, big believer in books about family relationships. And this one kind of takes that and puts it in an extreme environment, which I think really kind of heightens the emotions, not only of each individual character, but how they relate to one another as well. So it's just Totally dynamite. Uh, that's Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist by Sunil Yappa. Immediate download. I was, I, that's always my, I joke on the podcast, like sometimes Renee brings a book. I'm like, oh, immediately I'm opening my Libby app. I'm getting yeah, in this book. Yeah. That sounds incredible. And also, per, we didn't plan our picks in advance. In fact, I didn't even see <laughs> that there was an outline for this until we started recording because I'm the worst. But I love that our books, it sounds like they would kind of go well together. Absolutely. Yeah, these two would definitely pair. And I will say, like, I, I put these in an order, not in a specific order, but that was the first one I was going to talk about. Yeah. So I just think we're like-minded people. Ah. I agree. I agree. So I'm going to take a little bit of a... I don't know, heartwarming, weird turn, which, you know, two words that I typically like no, to read it's not, about. That's not very um, Tina of you. Heartwarming, weird. Yes. Oh my gosh. When I was writing this script, I was like, I want to reread all of my picks. So like, these are like very, very high quality. If I may, I think these are very high quality books. Next for me is The Humans by Matt Haig. This one came out in 2013 and it's science fiction. But don't let that disturb you. It's very accessible science fiction. And I love Matt Haig as a writer. He's so open about his mental health. And he's one of those authors that when you're reading him, it feels like he's like peeked into our head and just grabbed our thoughts and put them on the page. He's so good. And the cover of The Human says, body snatching has never been this heartwarming. And I couldn't agree more. It sounds so bizarre. But what you have is an alien. He gets sent to Earth and inhabits the body of Dr. Andrew Martin because Dr. Martin is a mathematics professor who just solved a previously unsolvable math problem. And this is going to have catastrophic consequences if the information gets out. So the alien gets sent to Earth to take over Professor Martin's life and stop the solution from being made public. Sounds bizarre, but what the the charm in this story is, you're basically seeing the world through this alien's eyes. And he has such funny observations about the way earthlings think, act, look, dress, eat. My favorite relationship in this book is between the alien and the dog. So if you're a dog lover, you'll like definitely enjoy that part. Um, I love this book so much. I still think about it years later. It definitely made me cry. I remember listening to it. It was one of the very first audiobooks I listened to. So if you are somebody that listens to audiobooks, I do think this is a good one. Um, it's The Humans by Matt Haig. So in have keeping with, I have not, but in keeping with uh, okay. us being so similar, I literally, yes, I went to the library yesterday and just randomly, I borrowed The Labrador Pact by Matt Haig, which I haven't read, obviously. It was just another oh. book of his. I was just laughing because I was just like, yeah. you know what? I, random. Very, very random. And I was like, well, I'm going to grab this. And as soon as I saw your list, again, as you mentioned, we did not plan this because mm-hmm. you didn't write yours in until just this, uh, just we started to record. <laughs> I just shared it as we're recording. Yeah. Um, I, uh, he's okay, great. It's so funny. Yeah, he is really, really great. All right, okay. So my next one, this is one that I specifically picked because of you. You told me to read a book last year that like, and now I'm drawing a complete blank, but It's a crime. It's a mystery one where a dad goes and searches for the killers of his son. Um, It was like one, it was very brutal. It was one of your favorite books of the year. Um, (laughs) That sounds like me. I know. I will. Oh, Razor Blade Tears? Razor Blade Tears. Thank you. I, yes. Oh my goodness. S.A. Cosby. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why I drew up like, okay. So this book (laughs) is called Revolver by Dwayne Swierczynski. Uh, It, also came out in 2016, uh, which is random, but it is the story of 
three generations of one family that is torn apart by bullets that were fired a half a century in the past. So it tells three different timelines, one in Philadelphia in 2015, one in Philadelphia in 1995, and one in Philadelphia in 1965. So the first one is the 1965. There's these two street cops. One is black, one is white. And they are gunned down at a bar while they're like basically on a routine, just kind of a visit. And one of the fallen officers, his name is Stan, he leaves behind a 12-year-old son. And that 12-year-old son then grows up to become a homicide detective named Jim Walchak. And he learns that his father's alleged killer was sprung from prison. So he like goes on this hunt to search down his father's alleged killer and tries to figure out like, why did you kill my father? And then there's 2015, where Jim, the homicide detective's daughter, Audrey, is a forensic science student and basically like reopens her grandfather's case to do a research paper and digs deeper and deeper and like kind of realizes that this person probably didn't kill her grandfather and her father may have done something terrible. And so like it weaves these three things back and forth, back and forth. And it's just like, it shows it's another book about families, but it's also like a, this like crime thriller. And it, it shows how like one single act can obviously affect like generations and generations of a family. And like, I think about this stuff all the time about like, if my grandfather didn't do X, Y, or Z, like he never would have met my grandmother. And then I never would have been here. Like, I I, I, I blow my mind about that. Like I freak myself out all the time about stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. this is like the, like cop procedural version of that. So it's Revolver by Dwayne Srichinsky. Okay, you're so good at recommending books. I downloaded this immediately. I'm really glad you're doing these podcasts because you're, you like, I mean, I, I've never heard you. of this book. <laughs> How long fair, have I been looking for books on the internet? Listen, I will tell you, I specifically grabbed this one and I was like, this is, I'm, re- you know, we're recommending books for my entire audience, but this one was for Tina. This was specifically for you. <laughs> for me specifically. Well, yeah. thank you. I appreciate it. You're and welcome. you nailed it because you're right. That is in my wheelhouse. Yeah. So speaking of forensics, I'm going to, a turn and take you to nonfiction. This book is called Working Stiff, Two Years, 262 Bodies, and the Making of a Medical Examiner by Judy Melnick and TJ Mitchell. This is a memoir about a young forensic pathologist's rookie season in New York City as the medical examiner and all of the curious and heartbreaking and impossibly complex cases that helped shape her, both as a physician and as a mother. She began her training as a New York City forensics uh, pathologist just two months before the September 11th terrorist attacks. Talk about baptism by fire. Yeah, she gets, I mean, literally thrown into the fascinating world of death investigation. She's performing autopsies, investigating death scenes, and counseling grieving relatives. I never would have thought all of that would be involved. Her stories would be interesting on their own, but of course, being in New York City during that time just added an extra layer because she shares a firsthand account of the events of September 11th. And then if you remember, there was a subsequent anthrax bioterrorism attack. There was another plane crash and, oh my gosh, chilling stories. And to think that it's true is even more mind-blowing. Now, I like nonfiction, but I do need it to be interesting and like well-written and Uh this was super propulsive. She actually has this dry sense of humor, which I really like. So she tells the stories, of course, with a lot of respect, but also there's a little bit of humor to it, just at life, at just the, the craziness that we all go through. And she also shares a little bit about the inaccurate inaccuracies in shows like CSI and Law and Mm -hmm. Order, but she brings you in the real morgue. I thought this was fascinating. If you like science, if you're somebody that's like really fascinated by this type of thing, I think you'll totally dig this book. And she wrote it with her husband. And they also have a medical examiner detective fiction series that I have my eye on. This was her first book, but they like then got into fiction, which sounds Mm -hmm. so interesting. So this book is Working Stiff, Two Years, 262 Bodies and the Making of a Medical Examiner by Judy Melnick and TJ Mitchell. Have you ever read The Poisoner's Handbook? No. Okay, so this this was not one of my recommendations originally, but The Poisoner's Handbook came out in 2011 and it's 
the it's by Deborah Blum, and the subtitle is Murder and the Birth of Forensic Medicine in the Jazz Age New York. It's also nonfiction, what? but it is written like fiction. Again, this is like another, this might just be another Tina book, but everyone else should read this too. It, um, <laughs> yes. So Deborah, Deborah Blum is the director of the Night Science Journalism Program at MIT, just like absolute flex of a genius. But this right. book, every, Casual. yeah, every single chapter goes through a different murder case that took place in the jazz age. And it talks about the, like, first that aspect is written like, uh, murder mystery where it's like this person was murdered and they used rat poison or they use like they basically talk about all these different poisons that were used and how during the jazz age like they were untraceable like if a wife wanted to murder her husband or if like a mob boss wanted to murder another mob boss like it was the ways that they would do it were just untraceable because they couldn't do this so it, it literally goes through the birth of forensic medicine through each of these different uh, each of these different like poisons and how they discovered that they could detect them in the blood and then how they, it, it's crazy. Yeah, The Poisoner's Handbook is such Bye. a fantastic book. I need to get this immediately. I, when you started describing it, it sounded like fantasy almost or like a fiction I, book. Like, I know, I did but not, it's not think it's, you were yeah. going to say <laughs> that it was yeah. real. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yep. So, okay. So that's The Poisoner's Handbook. That is not the next book I was going to recommend. The next book I was going to recommend is called Quiet Until the Thaw by Alexandra Fuller. This one came out in 2018, and it's the story of two Native American cousins, uh, Rick Overlooking Horse and You Choose Watson. And they end up being kind of on opposite sides of a dispute. I'm just now realizing that every single book I think I recommend has to do with like families being up against something, um, or at least these first three. So That's Rick, right. cho- yeah, Rick, um, there's this situation that happens within their tribe and they have to decide like how they're going to resolve it. And so Rick chooses to stay with the tribe and basically reestablish peace amongst all the people staying there. His cousin chooses like a violent, unpredictable path of his own and he just takes off. He spends three decades behind bars after doing something pretty horrible and he comes back and it's like he has to, he basically like threatens the peace of the the tribe and so his cousin has to determine like how he's going to handle it and what he's going to do and so it's this really complicated relationship but it's also what I really, really love is like it's set in um a it's set in the Sioux Nation in South Dakota and like so I love reading books from other cultures that are separate from mine that you learn a whole lot about how they live their lives. And it's really beautiful and it's really heartbreaking, but it is absolutely fantastic. So that's Quiet Until the Thaw by Alexandra Fuller. Now, Adam and I are on Zoom together right now and I can see him and he kept looking over his shoulder while he's talking about it. I'm like, is he looking at the book? I was like, no, I bet the dog came in. <laughs> yep, sure yeah. enough, you have a visitor. Yeah, my, <laughs> yeah, my dog is a... Uh, He's not feeling good What's today. His name, Holden? Just, yeah, that's Holden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he can't decide if he wants to lay with me or if he wants to go be someplace else. So he's Aww. he's moving mm-hmm. on down the road for a little bit. That's all right. He was so quiet when he, he came through. It's like, oh, hey, all right, bye. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh-huh. absolutely. That does sound good, too. Yeah. So what is your next so book? To my you? next one. My next book is also family drama, specifically mother-son drama. It is The Knicks by Nathan Hill. And I spoke about audiobooks earlier. If, okay, if you're going to listen to one book via audio, let it be the Knicks. The narrator is Ari Falakos, and he is a genius. He performs this novel. Did you listen to it when you read it? I, I read this one because I actually, I interviewed okay. Nathan like years and years and years ago, and they sent me an advance reader yeah. copy. Oh my gosh. It's so good. It came out in 2016, but the audiobook of this is fantastic. The story is fantastic as well. But anyway, I had to put a quick plug in for that narrator because he's so good. But the book is about Samuel Anderson Anderson. He is a writer whose career is kind of stalled. He is a adjunct professor at a community college or at a local college, and he's obsessed with this online video game. And he hasn't seen his mother Faye since she walked out on him when he was a child. But then one day, there she is all over the news because she threw rocks at a potential presidential candidate. And the media paints Faye as this militant radical with a sordid past. But Samuel's like, 
Um, my mom has never left her small town in Iowa. So what are they talking about? He becomes kind of obsessed with figuring out what happened naturally. And at the behest of his publisher, he agrees to write his mother's story. It's going to be a tell-all biography and a book that will air all of her dirty laundry. But first he has to find her and talk to her without crying because he has not seen her in years. The story is sweeping. I didn't say the genre is literary fiction, kind of historical fiction, but it starts in in the Midwest in the 60s. You go to New York, you go to Wall Street. There's the 1968 Chicago Democratic National Convention. And then finally you end up in Norway. And through all of these places, Samuel unexpectedly finds that he didn't know his mom as well as he thought he did. And she is a woman with an epic story to tell and one that she kept hidden from everybody. This was a debut, which is crazy to think about because it's so it's so well done. It's very ambitious. But I thought it was completely readable and very entertaining and funny. I laughed several times while reading this. So I kind of went through the range of emotions It's also got one of my all-time favorite covers. So uh, I just love this book. It was The Knicks by Nathan Hill. It is such a good book. And um, I remember asking Nathan, because it's such a... I'm always curious when I interview authors about like, if they talk about something that feels deeply personal, like the relationship in this book, I'm like, so how does your mom feel about it? And he goes, no, this was not our relationship whatsoever. So I was like, specifically... Uh <laughs> I'm sure he gets yeah. asked that a lot because it felt so real. Like, oh my goodness. Like he really nailed that like kind of complicated push pull. Um, mm-hmm. So I can see why it felt, you would think it might be autobiographical. Yeah. Um, so my next one, I had to do, I had to do one horror novel. I, I'm a spooky book reader all year round. Um, people who listen to my show know that I've, you know, especially lately, there's been a lot of spooky people coming on. So my next book is Error Rat by Christopher Golden. And I like to describe this as like a horror novel version of Indiana Jones. Um, It is, it won the Bram Stoker Award for Superior Achievement in a Novel, which I didn't even know was an award, the Superior Achievement in a Novel. It just sounds fancy. Um, It is the story of basically this adventure, like these researchers are on top of a mountain and they think that they find the like actual ark from Noah from the Bible. And basically they're on the mountain, this earthquake happens and there's like this secret cave that gets unveiled, that gets like revealed on the top of Mount Ararat, which is a real place in Turkey. And this is like, there's some historical aspects behind it where like biblical scholars think that potentially if Noah's Ark exists or existed, this is likely where you would find it. Um, this place fastens this with history, so don't like expect this to be a nonfiction. It is not. It is a horror novel where basically they think they discover Noah's Ark, and then there is something very, very creepy that is like a part of Like there's a monster that I don't want to talk too much about that it reveals itself. It's very much like... Um, John Carpenter's The Thing, where it's like this isolating, there's something about being isolated, but being isolated on top of a mountain where it's like this massive place, but you are still isolated and not being able to escape this horrible, chilling thing as it's kind of like systematically running through the whole group and like just sort of like, you know, terrorizing them. And it's very, very creepy. But again, like it it definitely reminds me of the like, uh, the like national treasure movies or like Indiana Jones, where it's like it's very much that like adventure archaeological aspect, but <laughs> with a, a horror twist. So that is Error Rat by Christopher Golden. I love that, and I've never heard of it. I love horror too, but I'm, I find I don't read enough of it. So I like feel like I need to flex my my horror wings. What I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I was I was just having a conversation. Um, yesterday with an author who will be on soon and we were talking about the fact that like I don't love watching horror because I hate jump scares but I love reading mm, horror because I can control the like the atmosphere and the pacing and everything um and so yeah like I if I look back on my my story graph I like basically every other book I read I'm realizing is horror like ba- more or less all year round and I'm like okay this is getting absurd yeah so, Ararat is uh, I love it very good yeah you're in your horror era. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, yeah, what's you know, your next funny. one? Hmm. My next one is horror, a little bit. So it's called Allegedly by Tiffany D. Jackson. And I would call it horror. Boy, this book, it came out in 2017. It was her debut. 
I cannot believe I was quickly looking it up as we were talking and it's for uh, reading ages 14 to 17 years. I do not agree at all. So I think it's technically YA, but like, no, it's not. It's adult. Yeah. Like, don't let your kids read this book. Uh, once I once I tell you about it, you're going to be like, oh, I understand why you say that. This is not for sensitive readers. Be sure to check trigger warnings on StoryGraph. I thought it was brilliant. It's about Mary B. Addison when she killed a baby, allegedly. Now, she didn't say much in her first interview with the detectives and the media kind of filled in the blanks only where it mattered. A white baby had died while under the care of a church-going Black woman and her nine-year-old daughter. And the public convicted Mary and the jury made it official. But she, did she do it? She won't say. So Mary survived six years in what she calls baby jail before being dumped into a group home. This group home is pretty brutal. It is a place where she does not feel safe. She fears for her life. And she finally gets this job. They're allowing her to take on some um, work and she meets Ted while she's there. And uh, she's at this nursing home and she and Ted start to have this relationship. He's the first person in a long time to see her as a person and things happen and it becomes more important than ever for her to find her voice and get out of the situation. She has a really complicated relationship with her mother, but it looks like she's going to have to rely on her to set the record straight. This book was so dark, but so thought provoking. I really appreciate how it shed light on like juvenile detention centers and these group homes and like the side characters in this book are really great. I never quite knew what to believe mm -hmm. and I'm going to leave it at that because the fun in this book is the reveal and the understanding of what really happened. I love uh, Tiffany D. Jack. Tiffany D. Jackson, and I highly recommend the other books of hers I've read, specifically The Weight of Blood and Grown. She is so amazing. And that was allegedly by Tiffany D. Jackson. Yeah, I am normally not one to be like, like I, I'm, I agree with you in the sense it's like young adults can should be able to read like advanced stuff. But yeah, this one is, it is dark. It is. Uh, I'm like, mm, I'm gonna keep this for adults. Like, yeah, I agree. Normally I'm like, yeah, read whatever. But I don't know. This is pretty. Pretty dark as far as yeah, things go. Pretty brutal, yeah. But it's it's incredible. And you're right. Like T Tiffany D. Jackson is one of those like just auto purchases. If I see that they have yes. a new book coming out, I'm yes. just like, yep, absolutely. Just put it in the cart. Just put it in the cart. A hundred percent. Yeah, I love her. Yeah. Um, all right. So my next one is called The Best We Could Do by Ty Bui. This came out in 2020. And I... Uh, there's so much about this book. I'm sorry. It actually came out in 2017. It, they, they reprinted it in 2020. Um, because I was looking, I was like, that's not right. I've had this book for way longer than that. Um, <laughs> it, it is a graphic novel, but it's like a 400 page graphic novel, which I mention only because Tai Bui did all of the writing and all of the illustrations herself. Like she did the entirety wow. of this book. It's incredible. It um, was a national book critics circle finalist. It won a whole bunch of awards. That's what it is, is Tai Bui's family in the 1970s escaped South Vietnam uh, in a very, very like daring, da daring and harrowing way. And this tells the story of their family once they've kind of settled in California. And Ty, like at, at the heart of the story is like, Ty didn't know much about her family's escape. And what ends up happening is she becomes a mother for the first time. And she's like wrestling with this really weird thing where she is now a parent, but she's also feels very much like a child at the same time. And so she's like wrestling with these emotions and she slowly kind of unveils the story of how her family escaped South Vietnam while she's also talking about like just the different struggles of being a parent. And then she wrestles with like, are my issues with not being able to put my baby down at all relatable to the things my parents went through? And so then she feels this guilt of like, should I be struggling with this? And like trying to get to know her family while trying to be a mom. And it is like, it's written very poetic and very like hauntingly. But again, like I, the thing that I always go back to with this book is like, the story is beautiful. It would be beautiful and heartbreaking if it was a novel, but like just the sheer work that went into this it's like a 400 page graphic novel and when you are reading it and looking at the imagery and you're like this human being did all of this it's like described as an illustrated wow. memoir and it is just it, it it's one of those moments where as a person who is aspiring to be a published writer I'm like 
I can't, I've written a book. So what this, that's nothing like this person, like created 400 pieces of art in addition to her story. It's just, it's so good. So that's the best we could do by Tai Bui. Oh man, that sounds really good. And I don't read a lot of graphic novels for no real reason other than Mm -hmm. I just don't think of it. But yeah, on occasion, I'm like, oh, I should get that. Yeah, I'm the same. I don't read a ton of them. But this one, I remember when it came out, I think they, I think the publisher sent me a copy of it and I was like, what is this? And like, I looked, flipped through it and I was just like yeah. sobbing onto the book as I was reading it. So <laughs> oh I'm my like, gosh. Oh, and I, lo- I love motherhood stories too. So I'm like, oh yeah, this one sounds yeah. right up my alley. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, I'm going to wrap things up with a, a favorite author of mine in her, f- my favorite book from my, one of my favorite authors. It's I Found You by Lisa Jewell. And this one came out in 2016. It is a mystery. And the story opens up with single mom, Alex Lake, and she finds a man on the beach outside of her house. She's in England. And this man has no name, no jacket, and no idea what he's doing there. And against her better judgment, against her better judgment, she invites him in to her home. And it then goes on to tell um, into an alternate point of view that of 21-year-old Lily, has only been married for three weeks. And her new husband has failed to come home from work one night She doesn't know what happened to him. She's new to the country and she doesn't know anybody. So she goes to to the police and they tell her that her husband never existed. So you've got these two women. There's about 20 years of secrets and a man who cannot remember his story. He doesn't know who he is. And that's the jumping off point. It's more of a slow burn, but I loved it. It's very complex and captivating, but funny too. I remember really liking Alice as a character because she's fully aware, like, why am I inviting this man into my home? Like, what am I doing? But like, does it anyway? Um, And you just know that these two women's lives are going to collide, but you're not sure how. I love how Lisa Jewell tells a very thrilling story without relying on the outrageous or over the top. You're just going to get a well-crafted, clever mystery. I would really like to read this again for the first time. So this is I Found You by Lisa Jewell. Lisa Jewell is fantastic. I, yeah, She's such like a master have you, storyteller. Have you interviewed her? I, yes, a long, long time ago. And yeah. it was like when I was new to interviewing authors. So it was one of those where like, I think one of my questions was like, how do you do, how, how do you do that? How do you make stories like this? Like, <laughs> how do you make up stuff? You know? <laughs> yeah. How you pret- how you do a pretend? Like how you do it? And she's like, hmm. Okay. She's yeah, like, was, great. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for interviewing me, Adam. Please don't ask questions anymore. <laughs> so, um, that yeah, that sounds fantastic. I I would. That's another one. Like if I see a Lisa Jewel book, I'll just pick it up and be like, "Yep." Oh yeah. For me. You know you're gonna get a good story. I don't care what it's about. It's gonna be good. Yeah. Um, okay. So my last one is called He by John Connolly. Uh, this is a fictional reimagination of this the life of Stan Laurel, who is one half of Laurel and Hardy, a very very famous old Hollywood comedy duo. Uh, A fun thing about me is I'm actually like 92 years old in my soul. And I love old Hollywood stories. Um, There's there's a very good podcast called You Must Remember This that comes out every like, I think it's like once a year. And uh, You Must Remember This did a a story about Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, like these the very famous horror actors who played like Dracula and Frankenstein in like the early 1920s and 30s. And I just like gobbled it up, like any story that has to do with this time. And I'm sure a lot of it comes with like when I was younger and I would watch these things, but we don't need to get nostalgic. Basically, he is the story of Stan Laurel, who's like now he's old and he's kind of in a retirement home and he 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 misses the life that he had. And it's the story of this person who like, he was kind of the butt of most of the jokes when it came to Laurel and Hardy. Like they were a very physical comedy troupe. And like, he was the bigger guy and he had like, basically all of these things happened to him. It was very like much a physical comedy person. And so he knew both like adoration and humiliation in that adoration. It's the story of like how he, and like how the two of them basically came to be and all these different things. But it's it's definitely fictionalized in the sense that like it's written in a really interesting way where they, he never really says his name, which is why it just says he, but it's obvious who they're talking about. Um, and it just like, it kind of recreates that like golden age of Hollywood as they call it. And this like very, very intensely like in 
deeply intense study of like the tension between the two of them and artistic integrity and all these different things. And yeah, I, I'm just a big nerd when it comes to like old Hollywood stuff. And, uh, and he by John Connolly very much scratches that itch. Oh my gosh, that you just unlocked a memory. I listened to that specific podcast. Not just you must remember this, but that episode. Uh-huh. And I it wasn't, I, I, the first I started listening to that podcast because I did a fantastic deep dive on Charles Manson's Hollywood and like the murders that took place. So I started to really get into the podcast after that. And I remember just kind of letting it play and listening to it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they can talk about anything and I'm going to be intrigued. But I remember listening to that episode, but wow, what a good yeah. story. And as a weird oh, small man. connection to it, um, the the person who hosts it and like does all the work on that is, her name is Karina Longworth. And she is the partner of Ryan Johnson, who's the uh, filmmaker who did like Knives Out and Glass Onion and Star Wars and Looper and all those different things. So like it made a lot of sense when I learned that. I was like, oh, so they're both. Oh, well, I was just nerds. scrolling through. I'm not a Star Wars girl um and i was like scrolling Same. through i'm like oh my god there's like 16 episodes on star wars but that makes sense if that's yeah. like her connection and okay yeah wow. so i but i'm with you i'm also not that's a, a whole nother thing star yeah. wars girl <laughs> yeah I'm, not, I'm also not a star wars gal exactly yeah so um okay so that's a whole bunch of book recommendations i hope everybody enjoyed this but before we go tina tell everyone where they can find you and your podcast and all that good stuff of course. So I am at TBR ETC or TBR, et cetera, on Instagram and on TikTok. And then my podcast is called Book Talk, et cetera. I co-host with Renee and you can find us on Instagram at Book Talk, et cetera. And, you know, kind of go from the rabbit hole from there. Yeah, I... I will. So normally I tell people like subscribe to the podcast of anyone who's on my show, but like follow both them on Instagram. You both, in addition to being my favorite podcast, I like, I get so many book recommendations just from your guys' Instagram. So, oh and gosh. your TikTok. Aren't you know, is, is Renee on TikTok? She's not on TikTok. No, Renee, that is where she's like, I'm, I just can't. I said, please don't. Like you have your, she's so good at, talk about finding good book recommendations. I'm like, where in God's green earth did you come up with this? Mm-hmm. I I just started having fun on TikTok and I'm like, it's kind of addicting now. And I could, yeah. like, that's not a good thing. <laughs> but like when a video takes off, I'm like, why have so many people looked at it? It's like creeping me out a little bit. <laughs> I will but say you are fun. very, you're very, very good at TikTok. I'm happy to admit that you're fantastic oh at it. Gosh. Oh, well, okay. thank you. Well, Thanks for having me. Oh my goodness. Yeah. This was so, so much fun. Tina, thank you for joining me today. Anytime. Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other Evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell. 